I hope you can hear me. Yeah, okay, I can hear myself as well. Okay, good. So thanks everyone for coming to this panel, and it's a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, of this event. And uh, today we have uh, the panel that uh, we will have now is about ensuring sustainable and resilient infrastructure investment. And uh, we should uh, be here for around one hour. And I'll have my uh, uh, phone here just to measure the time. So uh, the idea is we have two rapporteurs, so-called rapporteurs from the civil society. Marco Sosic uh, and Ardian Hakai, I'll briefly introduce them in a second, who will present the main recommendations uh, from the, uh, the, the working groups uh, that, that have been gathered here. And they will speak uh, slightly more about that. And uh, they should uh, be very brief about that, maybe 10 minutes or something. And after that, we have three commentators, which are unfortunately not here uh, in person, but uh, we have them uh, over the internet online. So we have first Jona Marovic. I'll introduce them, uh, everybody, in a second. Then uh, Ari Naim and Nadim Begovic. And uh, so the idea is that they will comment briefly each of them around five minutes on what the rapporteurs have said, or maybe something in addition uh, to that that they, they can say from their point of view. And after that, we have a fishbowl format, which means that the people who are here present in the audience are encouraged to ask questions or comment or whatever, say something, speak about the topic that we have here. And the fishbowl format means that you're not asking the question from there, but you're joining the panel here and you're talking, you're becoming part of the panel and you're talking with, with all of us. So you're equal to all of us. But the idea is also that you don't occupy the panel, but you just go here for five, 10 minutes until you ask your question, give your comment, and we have a reflection. And after that, you leave so that someone else joins the panel. I know that it might not work. Let's see how it works. I encourage you to, to join to the, to the panel. If you, don't, if you really don't want to join, you can also ask the question from, from the podium. But the, also, in order to encourage you to join to the panel, I, I promise that I will buy a beer to everybody who, who, who comes here. So that, that's kind of, I'm an economist. Yeah. So I like incentives. They are for free. Offered by the... Really? I think so. You, did, you didn't have to tell this. Come on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's the idea. We have fish balls to ask questions. And if you're shy to ask questions, I will be... Uh, I'll have... Uh, I have uh, plenty of questions in my, in my folder. So yeah. That's the idea of this, of this panel. So let's start now with a brief introduction of everybody about, uh, who is present on this panel. So uh, my name is Brian Milovanovic. I'm uh, an, an economist. I'm an economic researcher. Uh, at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, but I'm originally from the Balkans, I'm originally from North Macedonia, but I've been living in Vienna for two years and I'm an economic researcher. So I will speak about these uh, things from a macroeconomic point of view, first and foremost. Then we have Marko Sosic, who is a researcher from, he, he comes from, uh, from Montenegro, from, from Podgorica, from the Alternativa Institute. And his area of expertise, I don't want to go into too much details, but his area of expertise is briefly public financial management. So yes. he's, uh, he's mainly an expert in public finances, but he will speak about infrastructure investment from a public financial uh, point of view. And then we have Ardian Hakai, who is a director of the, let me read the, the exact name, Cooperation and Development Institute in Tirana, but also a research director of the Tirana Connectivity Forum. So it's a forum which uh, uh, takes place in Tirana, and it's about connectivity. So his area of expertise is mainly EU accession, but also lately, I think, connectivity issues. I also don't want to do, uh, spend too much time on, on uh, people's CVs. Then we have uh, Jovana Marovic, who is over, over the internet, uh, who is the deputy prime minister of Montenegro, and also the minister of EU affairs. And before uh, coming to this position, uh, she, was, uh, she, she was working at various uh, government positions, but also non-government positions. So she has a very interesting uh, portfolio, let's say CV, coming, working both for the government and for the non-government sector. Uh, hello, Yovana. And then we have Ari Naim, who, is, who comes uh, from the uh, IFC, or International Finance Organization, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. So uh, uh, basically, he, he's the uh, director, the regional director, regional manager for Central and Southeast Europe. And IFC, if I'm not wrong, has a portfolio of around 2 billion euros of investment in the whole region. And uh, it's mostly a private investment. So they're kind of encouraging private investment. So he can speak uh, more about this. Hello, uh, Ari. And then we have, uh, last but not least, uh, Nedim Begovic, who comes 
from another or, or international organization, which is called uh, the Transport Community, and it's located in Belgrade. And he is, um, they're working on transport issues in the region, but he's the person who is responsible for the transport aspects uh, or part of the green agenda, which is uh, going on, which the, his organization is uh, kind of working on. So hello, Nedim. And uh, so... Uh, without further ado, now we go to the panelists and we start with Marco. So Marco, your five minutes about the main recommendations you have for this uh, question of how to ensure sustainable but also resilient infrastructure investment in the region. And I will uh, try to notify you when, you, you when you're out of time by raising this poll. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, I will not try to... I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm turning my back to my deputy prime minister. <laughs> Just but never, you, you, you can see. Never a good idea, especially Yovana. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm not going to read the recommendations. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to try to explain what, what we talked about in our group and what, what was the whole talk, topic about. So we are talking about infrastructure investment and uh, from our point of view, from the point of view of civil society in the region and uh, trying to see how we can be more involved in this topic, both at the national level and also at this emerging and very important level for all of our countries, which is re uh, related to the uh, Western Balkans investment framework, uh, where all of our countries apply for projects, and this represents a kind of a separate uh, project pipeline that we have. Uh, why is this important for us? We think that uh, uh, the space for CSO's involvement in policy making is uh, not big in the Western Balkans, but it's kind of the, the, the least developed in the area of budget, and even less so in the area of budgetary, budget for public infrastructure planning. And uh, uh, we, uh, in our group, uh, discussed what are the main obstacles for greater civil society involvement in this sense. And the first one was the lack of data. So lack of data overall. Uh, this is the precondition for a meaningful participation in order for us to be on equal footing with all the stakeholders, both governmental and uh, those coming from the EU, is that we all uh, kind of uh, have the same data in our hands. Uh, this is uh, the capital budget or public infrastructure budget in all of our countries is one of the most obscure parts uh, of it. It is basically uh, not so large, for example, for the national level. Uh, you know, in the countries of the region, it's from 10 to 20 percent of the budget. But taken as a whole, as, as, a, as an expense, it's probably one of the most important expenses in the national budgets that we have because it's not mandatory, such as salaries or pensions or uh, social transfers. It is completely discretionary. The governments can plan how many projects they can implement in a year and they can allocate uh, as much funds as they can or as they want. And it is often used as a sort of a political uh, bargaining place. Uh, it is often used as a, as a place of promises, not of delivering on commitments. For example, in Montenegro, uh, 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 I would say a, a populist move of then government, n not uh, in, on which Jovana was not a part of, but uh, last year she was, uh, she was not there. But they, for example, used the opportunity to promise more than 350 new projects in the capital budget of Montenegro to its citizens. However, now uh, we see that over 250 of those projects are, are so immature that they cannot even be moved from the ground. There's, the, nothing can be done. They were just used at a certain political po uh, moment as a, uh, as a promise, uh, but without any hope of, of, of delivering. Uh, so uh, in all of our countries, we think that this should be a more, uh, an issue that's more on the public agenda. How the governments plan, uh, select capital projects, major public infrastructure projects, with these limited funds that they have, both at their national disposal and also at the disposal of, for example, uh, WBIF, is a matter of huge concern. Right now, from what we see from the work that analytical work that organizations are doing, and that, for example, IMF is doing, that is, uh, it boils down to uh, the fact that the governments do not have proper methodologies for s uh, selecting these projects, that when they are selected, uh, the, p the whole procedure for proper planning is not there, and then that leads to problems in execution, in the implementation of these projects, 
which then leads to the fact that most of them don't see the light of day or they are dragged on year from year with extended deadlines, extended budgets, and so on and so on. So we think that this issue needs to be more on the EU's agenda when it is uh, in the enlargement strategy. It cannot only be a footnote in the European Commission reports uh, as it is right now. Uh, not a lot of attention is paid to it. And how do we reform this important sector of policymaking? And then, on the top of it, how well are the citizens, mostly through CSOs, included in the process of planning? This is perhaps uh, the best chance for including, for making a transition to a sort of participatory budgeting, where the citizens are actually have a say on what is being built, in which projects do we involve, invest most of our efforts. Uh, right now, there is absolutely no inclusion. Uh, I don't even think that the citizens know when they, their countries are applying uh, with projects to, for example, WBIF. And then when these projects are selected, they don't have a lot of information on what happens with them, with the stages, when can they, can they expect outputs. And, 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 but maybe I've, uh, I've extended, I've overreached my time. RDM will cover the rest, yeah. Thanks, Marco. Excellent, excellent introduction and an excellent summary of your main recommendations. Great. RDM, let's come back to you now. So what, what are your uh, thoughts about the whole process and maybe what Marco said? Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd like to start by saying to, the, to everybody, sharing with everybody, that we uh, decided with Marco to be the happy panel, in the sense that, um, I mean, we, I mean, there was enough gloom and doom and whatever, complaining uh, how powerless we are. That was me in my happy <laughs> mode. Yeah. So we said, guys, I mean, we will be the ones that uh, we will change things. And I'm serious about this. But I will come a little bit, was, was discussed about this um, dichotomy between a rule of law and uh, versus stability. I think it's a false debate. It has always been a false debate. The idea, their short reply is that they go together. It's a false uh, friend. Um, the answer lies in the solidity of the institutions, in the sense that um, if you go for the stability of corrupt and captured institutions, you will work with unreliable partners, right? So you will not have any certainty that your partners in this part of the continent will, need, will be by your side first, and second, will be able to be by your side when you'll need them, right? So let's better not have corrupt and incompetent institutions or governments in place. And this is why we want the rule of law. So I want to underline this. It's about good governance. It's not about rule of law. We need to be a little bit more specific. Second, about the Berlin process. It has been our baby since uh, 2014 when uh, Chancellor Merkel handed it to us, to the Western Balkans. I mean. It's uh, now, I just want to say, it's about cohesion. We have been talking about enlargement for the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. It doesn't make any more sense to enlarge in the Western Balkans. It's counterintuitive even. Our, we need to... Uh, converge with the EU institutions according to the EU values. And to do this, we, know, we need new mechanics and new, new mechanisms and new allies. And this is where we come from. This is where the civil society comes from yeah, because we are the best allies. What do we want to do? We want to participate not only during the, consulta the consultations. When things are sent for us to be consulted, the deal is done, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And first of all, nobody pays for being consulted. We are not even paid for the consultations that we do. So we need to participate in the draftings. We have done some very specific, I will not read it. We have, had, we have adopted a can-do attitude with these uh, uh, recommendations. There are very specific things that uh, make possible for specialized, I would say not everybody is interested, and rightly so but specialized civil society organizations and think tanks that have the expertise, the technical expertise, that have the knowledge. And I don't want to hear that we don't have the expertise or the knowledge. I mean, this is not even serious to be considered with. We have it. We, can, we have produced even prime ministers and deputy prime ministers. <laughs> we have ministers, you know. So if we are good to be ministers, we are also very good to be consultants. So we have the expertise. And... Um, the other uh, thing that we are trying to 
to, to discuss in here, which is very, it is a very important, let's say, I would say even mental jump. We have stopped or we do not consider anymore advising our politicians. It doesn't make sense for me to advise my prime minister because he will not listen to me. Why he will listen to me? I'm not elected. How many of us here are membership-based organizations? We are not elected. We do not have agency to advise our prime ministers and we don't have entry points. Ah, if we go a degree lower to a minister or to a head of department, to people that deal with policy making, yes, we can. There are mechanisms that demand our inclusion. We have agency because we have sector expertise and we have the knowledge. So we go from politics to policy making. And also we have some very good partners. We have some very good partners that make this uh, possible. We have very good partners with Regional Cooperation Council. We have very good partners with Transport Permanent Secretariat. We have very good partnerships, and I think I just had a chat with uh, Ms. Kramon, von Kramon, with European Parliament. So when we are having very good uh, cooperation uh, co uh, discussions with Western Balkans investment framework. And I will stop here. Great, great. No, you are very good uh, when it comes to the timing, which I appreciate a lot. Thank you very much. Very nice introduction. So now let's go to Jovana. Jovana, uh, your reflections on what we heard so far, or maybe also something in addition to, uh, to what we heard so far from your perspective? Around five minutes, please. Thank you very much. As you said, um, I was involved in the civil society for 10 years, so maybe some of the issues are uh, more familiar to me than to other government officials. So as Marco said, uh, uh, for example, in Montenegro, we have really developed the framework for participation of civil society, but it is at least developed in the area of budget and, and infrastructure. But also I have to uh, disagree with Ardian because uh, there is lack of interest of civil society organization to monitor the infrastructure projects and also a lack of donor support, that's also true. And uh, since I've been in the civil society for 10 years, I really uh, just know that Marco is following the issues and Marco is the only one which is providing recommendations on, on budget and uh, both a national and local ones. So I, am all, I also agree it's all important. <laughs> <laughs> it's really important to include the civil society in early stage and early, early stage of consultations when it comes to the definition of, of um, priorities and projects for, uh, um, for applying, for example, within the European investment plan. It's also important to have strategic and systematic approach if we want to, to use uh, um, uh, in effective way uh, funds from the European investment plan. And also it's important to strengthen the rule of law if we want to have better negotiating capacity and also better capacity to uh, apply and to, impl to imp apply for and to implement the EU funds. In that sense, I think that uh, it's also important to have civil society in all these areas which may, might be for this discussion not that much interesting, but that they are really relevant for chapters 23 and 24. The other thing is that, uh, of course, uh, as you already said, it's not just about the definition of priorities and, and projects for, uh, uh, for applying and for funds. It's also important to have civil society in the, con the committees and also during the monitoring of stages and, and phases. Maybe it would be good to develop model within the Berlin process kind of networking and exchange of information between the civil society which are dealing with uh, these issues in the Western Balkans in general. And also, there are also um, when it comes to EU funds and with all complicated procedures, there are also uh, uh, strict deadlines for applying to, for the EU funds. For example, for the next year, the EU is reprogramming the, the funds for the uh, energy crisis, so we had really short deadlines in that sense, and we are now also redefining priorities for the next year. So there are always some changes in that timeline and also for the inclusion of, of the civil society. Uh, so the early stage and consultation with the civil society, the monitoring uh, stage, but also in uh, terms of technical capacity and providing technical assistance uh, I think that there is also need for mapping donor support in order to have this better um, support of the civil society in the Western Balkans. So I agree with all the recommendations. I, hopefully I have um, better sens sensitivity 
for the civil society inclusion. So we are open for all the, all the recommendations. And I think that there is also need for kind of database, even at the local level for each municipality and to receive on regular basis these suggestions for the civil society. So if there are short deadlines, to use that database for, for definition of the project priorities. Thank you. Excellent, Excellent. Jovan, a, a very good timing again. So thank you very much for that. Let's go to Ari now. So Ari, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, you are also, before joining the IFC, where you have been for the last 20 years or something. Before that, you are also in a private in a, in a private bank, in private banks. So uh, what's your take on these things, uh, especially from this perspective of IFC and also private banking? Well, uh, thank you very much, Banimir. <clears throat> um, you know, needless to say, uh, IFC, uh, it is very clear to us that the civil society is indispensable in building sustainability, resilience and impact in all of our investments. So we've done a lot of work. Uh, we see SOs globally and at the, at the local level, wherever we invest, to build trust uh, and to build uh, partnerships uh, in the development of this project. So if you allow me, I mean, I, I, I will make a few points uh, <clears throat> more general on infrastructure uh, in the Western Balkan, because I believe this uh, agenda is really especially critical in the region. If you want to be successful in building the sustainable, resilient, inclusive infrastructure that is much needed, you know, uh, the region has an opportunity but it also risks uh, being left behind if it does not urgently improve on, on the design, the financing, the implementation of these infrastructure investments. Uh, I would just recall that uh, uh, in 2020, uh, this IMF study that uh, Marco mentioned, I mean, uh, the IMF stated that uh, in Central, Southeast and uh, Eastern Europe, closing just 50% of the infrastructure gap with the EU 15 countries by 2030 would cost between 3 and 8% of GDP per year. And since now two years have passed with not much infrastructure being built, I must say, uh, I guess it's, it would be even, even more uh, now. Another important point I want to note is um, infrastructure projects, you know, we build now are for the next 40 years. And, uh, and hence investing now in better design, governance, planning, is absolutely critical. So uh, the role of the CSO there and the recommendations that you are putting forward, I mean, seems absolutely uh, essential. Especially, uh, and I think governments a bit uh, do not always see that, we are at a time of very important disruptions. Disruption in climate patterns, in technologies, and also in consumers' patterns, you know, that we have seen with uh, COVID, the digital, the immobility, etc. All these represent very much uh, large risks for long-term investments going forward. Uh, and, and so, uh, of course, IFC advocates for uh, private engagement and public-private partnerships. But the point here is that public funding and EU funding will not be enough. Countries need to better leverage public-private partnerships to be able to attract private capital, but also to share some of these risks uh, with uh, best practice players, not only during project construction and then to be delivered with the project, but over the full li lifetime of the operation. So that being said, uh, it does represent a number of additional complexity uh, in terms of uh, in terms of planning, as you say, and design. And so forgive this long introduction, but this is to say that from IFC perspective, we very much welcome the spirit of your recommendations. Uh, very often, the most, the more challenging the um, on, an operating environment is, the more impactful infrastructure investment can be, but also risks are higher and they must be mitigated and, uh, and managed. So what we see in uh, the recommendations that you just mentioned, I mean, Proposing a permanent and structured dialogue with uh, civil society organization through the project life cycle, increasing accountability of policy makers, increased focus on governance and integrity that uh, Ardian mentioned. I mean, this is very much in line with our own views of how the region could implement a more resilient, a more sustainable and more impactful projects. Uh, too often, for instance, I mean, we see governments uh, 
choosing what they believe is a fast track bilateral engagement with a such or such partner versus a well-structured and more lengthy competitive process. Uh, and too often we see these fast tracks becoming actually uh, dead ends. So it's very much also in line with our own standards, the, the, the IFC performance standards and environmental and social guidelines that we actually we request to our uh, clients to follow in the investment that we finance. Uh, and uh, when it comes to engaging with CSOs, very often, you know, uh, it is true, as you mentioned, that key structuring decisions have already been taken by government institutions in public-private partnerships. And, and hence, sometimes it is too late to engage with for our clients when actually the engagement should be much more upstream. So also very much in line with the spirit of uh, what you are proposing. One specific uh, comment I would make uh, is also for the CSO community. You know? The CSO community is often very complex and composed of organization with a large range of views, sometimes quite fragmented. So uh, any thinking within civil society organizations on how best they can ensure effective alliances, but also representation will facilitate the engagement on infrastructure with both uh, governments and, and private players. So I, I would stop here uh, for the sake of time and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ali. Very good timing again. So you're all very good today. I agree very much with the uh, point that you uh, made about the uh, need for infrastructure investment, but I'll come back to that a bit later. Now let's go to Nedim. Nedim, what's your take? What, what are your two, sen two cents on all this, especially from the point of view of the transport community? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so basically, from our side, we recognize that the transport is one of the main polluters, right? Just after the, the energy sector. And that's why last year we actually adopted a sustainable and smart mobility strategy to guide the green and digital uh, transition here in the region for transport in order to make our transport uh, greener and more sustainable and definitely uh, less polluting for, for all of us. And I want to say that one of the 10 flagships there is actually making mobility fair and just for all. Uh, for the social uh, aspect and civil societies, actually we have in our transport community treaty very uh, loudly emphasized uh, the necessity to uh, establish social di dialogue, to establish social partnerships, to take into account social aspects. And uh, we have been doing some stuff, but uh, I think we can do even more. Uh, basically, I think one of the things that we have done last year and this year is uh, having our uh, workshop on urban mobility with the IFIs, with the civil society, with the uh, cities in the region, sharing ideas, what is done and what could be improved, right? To trying to connect all of these different aspects and taking everybody's opinion on board. Uh, also, uh, what we are now preparing is uh, one report on people with uh, reduced mobility and their access to the main uh, stations here. Again, including uh, civil society. And the next year, definitely, we plan to improve even this aspect, the social forum, and we plan to definitely have more panels and more inclusion uh, of civil societies uh, on a policy aspect, because we are primarily organization dealing with the policy issues and with the policy issues uh, and having all of the opinion of the civil society on board we can actually influence how the projects uh, from the strategic side then we can later on influence how the projects will be developed i think uh, i think i can just agree with what everybody else said uh, so having civil society there having their opinion included uh, it's very important for the ac accountability, for transparency, and we as a transport community treaty will definitely uh, work in the future, especially for your part of recommendations of having a better uh, and permanent and structured dialogue. Great, thanks. Thanks. Very good timing again. Okay, so now let's go after this first introductory round of uh, addresses. Can we go to the podium and uh, ask you, do you have any question or any comment on this issue? Anybody? Okay, think about Okay, that's good. Uh, would you be so nice to join the panel here? Excellent. I like this very much. So, yes, you have five minutes, please. That is too much, probably. Uh, so, uh, a little bit of realities. 
uh, existing infrastructure in the Balkans is used in a range between 15 and 30 percent of available capacity. The thesis that there is a shortage of infrastructure is not really well justified. So the role of civil society is probably identifying available capacities that could be used, identifying the bottlenecks and the policy problems why the existing infrastructure is not used, and basically understanding that better use of existing infrastructure is nine times better by the analysis of the World Bank, nine times better contribution to GDP and employment than actually building a new infrastructure. I appreciate that uh, building a new infrastructure is attractive to the governments, as uh, Arjan uh, described it, uh, in his speech, for a variety of reasons. But uh, use of existing infrastructure helps. And uh, I would uh, recommend that we just mention existing infrastructure, ports, railways, River Danube, which is only 15% used, pipelines all around, uh, roads, etc., etc. So there is an inf existing infrastructure, and we have to be aware of the existence of it. I think that's a very good remark, but I would, I would, uh, you can stay maybe here for a while. Let's let's have maybe a, br a brief discussion on this. I agree to some extent that there is some infrastructure, but even this infrastructure which you mentioned, like the river or the railways, they require additional investment. You cannot use the existing railway, which goes, I don't know, from whatever, from Slovenia to, to Macedonia, wherever, uh, to have high-speed trains. You must invest in order to make it, uh, to, to, to be able to use it. So, I understand your question. But tell me, what's wrong with the, with the slow-going trains? <laughs> I mean, uh, you cannot travel with them. That, no, that's wrong. I mean, a, if a, I, if a, I, if I have to travel from Skopje to Belgrade, uh, just, if just, I need just, eight, eight hours to travel with a train, uh, I would never do it. I appreciate that. But uh, in a normal railway system, anywhere in Europe, uh, passenger travel is just a small fraction and most often subsidized fraction of uh, revenues. Most of this is heavy cargo. And heavy cargo doesn't need high-speed trains. You just need a, a reliable, working, predictable train. So uh, there, are, there was a, a very good study on a train line uh, between, for example, London and Edinburgh, where when asked about eventual high-speed train, uh, the passenger said, no, 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 we just need a reliable train with a good internet in it. So uh, uh, basically, the story here is, let's try to use what we have in the best possible way, and once we are already using it, then see what else we need. And eventually, let's try to identify the bottlenecks, why some existing infrastructure is not really used to, to, to the possible extent. So, uh, for example, you have the largest inland waterway port in Europe, it's actually Belgrade port, which is totally unused. In uh, unused? Unused. Or unusable? Can oh, you, can no, you no, use no, it's it? perfectly usable. It was used for decades. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, policy reasons, soft reasons, it's not used. So th there is a, a space for engagement of the civil society, discovering the policy problems, discovering the bottlenecks, pointing out, uh, telling people that there is an opportunity to use these things and so on and so on. So there, there is a big interesting space for engagement. Can I bring another example here? Yeah, sure. I mean, let's take this famous Adriatic Ionian corridor. Uh -huh. uh, when uh, we see, I mean, how much we trade with Montenegro, Albania with Montenegro, it's 1.3% of our uh, international trade, 1.3%. So with 1.3%, we'll, we build this huge corridor while 
um, uh, trading 75% uh, uh, through the Dura Sport, you know, makes it evident that we need to review a little bit the allocation of our available budget. And this, is, this goes on what uh, Alexander just said. And when I asked uh, people in charge of planning uh, this uh, infrastructure, I said, guys, I mean, why do we do this whole highway? I mean, with all this money, we can build schools, hospitals, can have more satellites. Now we'll have only two. Uh, the guy... <laughs> Just to, to add the, I, I, add the I, I, keep, keep the satellites on mind because it's also infrastructure uh, and we will have them. So uh, the, guy, the guy replied, yeah, but this is the, this is, but the expert from EU told us, I know, because we need to have three lines on each side. And we're like, all right, okay. But okay, I mean, this is why we need, I mean, and I will quote a very knowledgeable German person that I, with whom I have a coffee today. We need to have... Uh, civil society or, let's say, people, citizen representative uh, involvement in critical junctions, in critical paths when we decide about infrastructure. We need to know better uh, the, soci the societal choices as versus leaders' visions. Just to paraphrase a little bit, Ari, sometimes we have our leaders, which are all knowledgeable, they know everything. They will say, listen, when I was young, I used to go from here to there, let's say, by train, so why not build this train? Or, I mean, I want this to be like this, why don't be... This is how a big part of infrastructure investments are done, or at least they start. We need to have a more societal choice expressed. Okay, good. No, uh, thanks a lot for, for these remarks. I agree with what you said. It's very good uh, insight. Thank you very much for it. But I still don't think that it's a substitute for greater investment, at, at least in some areas. They are not ex uh, mutually exclusive. You can have both. You can uh, both no, try to use existing infrastructure indeed. better, mm -hmm. but also invest more in infrastructure. And actually, my main uh, comment on, on the recommendations uh, that uh, the civil CSOs or whatever, this working group had on infrastructure, here is that they don't mention higher, greater investment in infrastructure anywhere. It's more, everything is about transparency, uh, participation, inclusion of civil societies, better, let's say, a way of organizing the processes, but nothing on more investment in, in infrastructure, which Ari mentioned, uh, Ari mentioned one uh, thing regarding to this. There are also many other data. So my, my first comment here would be that we really need greater investment in infrastructure, especially, especially thinking about this, this energy transition or green agenda. I mean, we are all talking now about this energy crunch, energy crisis. The only way out of it is to invest in renewable energy. The Balkans have a potential for it. We've done a discussion on this uh, in, a, in a similar group last year on that. And the experts agree that the Western Balkans have a great potential for in renewable energy. You have rivers, you have sun, you have wind. So you can do it, but we still don't see any investment or any big investment in that. So maybe, you know, uh, some comment. That, of is, that is true. There is a need for power generation, renewable energy, indeed. But uh, high voltage lines and cross border high voltage and cross border uh, interconnectors are used to only 15% of available capacity. So the potential for trade across border is much, much bigger than currently used. And there is a policy reason for that. There are a couple of policy reasons. And it's quite good that uh, civil society helped discovering these reasons. So enhancing the cross-border trade using existing infrastructure. So yes, both things apply, agree. Uh, but uh, uh, the right balance between these two is a serious policy question and need a participation of civil society to discover the right balance. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. I like, I like what you said very much. So can we maybe a uh, brief uh, comment from, from you, Marco, on what was said now? Uh, yeah, I, I, com I completely agree with uh, Mr. Kovacevic uh, about uh, also about the maybe luxury of high-speed travel. I was fortunate enough to travel a couple of times from London to Edinburgh by that train. And it takes five or six hours. And it's a beautiful, I did most of my, the most beautiful reading and work that I did was on that, uh, on those journeys. So, uh, kidding aside, uh, in, from our perspective, whether you enhance the existing infrastructure or build new, 
from the perspective of planning infrastructure investment, it, come, it boils down to the same. You have the process of selecting, uh, assessing project ideas, and then finding the ways of funding them. And what you said before about the lack, the main objection you have, as I understood, uh, to our recommendations is that we don't mention anywhere the, uh, uh, the, the need to increase uh, investments. However, uh, what we were trying to illustrate is that the existing systems of planning, uh, building, monitoring, reporting on infrastructure, even with these investments at this slow level, are not functioning. This is not solved by increasing funds. It's, we have to uh, be more cautious about how we spend what we have right now. And the another, another point when we were talking about critical infrastructure, about railroads, about ports, uh, energy investments. The key issue for me there is related to state-owned enterprises because most of these investments are actually delivered or uh, uh, given to SOEs to implement. For example, in Montenegro, the National Railroad Company is the one restructuring or building, uh, 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 reinvesting in the, in the railroad network, and it has a big loan, and the state has guaranteed for it. However, when we ask them, and when we try to discover a, a, a little, even a detail about what, what's going on with this money, uh, we have no idea, because state owned enterprises in our countries are black boxes of the already very gray public sector, how they operate, how they spend these significant, significant loans for which the country has, uh, the state have, has guaranteed. That's a huge, huge issue. And just uh, leaving this issue to them, uh, to unreformed, uh, wasteful, unproductive, bastions of party employment, bastions of misuse of public funds. So these are the actors to which we say, okay, uh, make this uh, 21st century railroad happen or increase the, uh, the, 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 our energy production and stuff like that. So that to me, or port, renovate our ports and airports. I mean, to me, that just simply doesn't go together. We need a stronger oversight from the state as the owner of these companies and then from the CSOs, and for that, a precondition is more transparency and more, more. That's, I think, the, mo the best way to create demand uh, from the CSOs to, uh, first of all, increase the access to data. Without it, we, we, we are simply not uh, on equal footing. We cannot talk to somebody who has all the information and we have none, and then we say, and he doesn't want to give it to us. So, and then what, what can we do? How can we meaningfully contribute? Thanks, and I agree fully with the transparency and participation part. What I'm just saying is that it's not the whole story. It's one part, but you have the part on, uh, regarding greater investment, and you also have the part that was mentioned about better use of current infrastructure. So I would like to see all these things there in the recommendations, but let's go. Yeah, okay, 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 no, sure, okay, okay. I, I'm pretty sure we have many questions. Okay, Nadim, please, you want to say something? Okay, let's go, let's go with the online panelists now. Nadim, please. Uh, sorry, because it was a transport just to reflect some of the things. Uh, yeah, I can just agree with the gentleman. Uh, usage of current infrastructure, of course, is very important. But what we have in the region uh, is maintenance backlog. So you have actually, for example, railways, which were designed for the speeds of 120, but because they were not maintained, they can now actually achieve the speeds of 30, 30 or 40. Right, so it's not even, uh, we are not talking about high speed, we are talking about something normal speed that you, could, you can actually drive from one capital to the other. Uh, I drove a couple of times from Belgrade to Sarajevo to Zagreb. It was a very pleasant experience, but very time consuming experience. Uh, so also I think where civil societies, in my opinion, should be actively involved in the part of the design, yes, but also in the part of uh, customer satisfaction. So, because many times in the planning, we all know we need better infrastructure, it needs to be better used. But what is your opinion, what is actually not working, where are the actual bottlenecks, what can be maybe quickly improved without big investments, and what is actually hurting? I can give an example of uh, knowing exactly when your train is coming, is leaving, do you have all the information available, can you pay for them online, and those kind of things. So I think. Next to the, what we already discussed in the process of designing the, the infrastructure, I think civil society inclusion in the process of the customer satisfaction uh, is also very important. Thanks, excellent. Ari, did you want also to comment? Uh, yeah, please. First, <clears throat> first, let me say that Marco made the best uh, 
argument uh, for why IFC focuses so much on private sector because uh, it is true that uh, you know uh, uh, when when government institutions run poorly a business, well they can continue doing it forever. When a private sector company runs a business, if they don't run it well, they go out of business, uh, and that's the big difference. Uh, so uh, you know. Uh, uh, Public-private partnerships are a great way to ensure that projects are not only environmental and socially sustainable, but they are also financially sustainable and they will uh, generate uh, uh, financial sustainability over the long term. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to, to to highlight in response to Mr. Kovacevic that certainly I mean uh, certainly we 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 can make a better use of the uh, public infrastructure in uh, transportation and. By the way, improving the way our state-owned companies work is is one of the key uh, one of the key uh, initiatives that could be taken there. But when it comes to, I mentioned the risks for the region not to uh, urgently uh, match uh, its bridge its infrastructure gap. I mean, let's talk about digital infrastructure that will allow the new economy and people to to see the opportunity of the new economy. Renewable energy, of course, uh, Marco mentioned it, but also waste management uh, that is an enormous, an enormous uh, toll on our environment in the region. Water treatment and wastewater treatment, irrigation. I mean, I am also based in Belgrade and in Vojvodina. Maybe three percent of the land is irrigated, while we are facing completely new climate patterns as part of the risks that I mentioned, and we don't know the sustainability of the agriculture sector if it continues relying on, on rain patterns. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yes, I mean, there is a huge infrastructure gap if the region wants to get where it needs to be in 10 years from now, uh, and that's not just transportation. Thanks, Ariel. Excellent. Jovana, do you also want to briefly reflect on what was said so far? Yes, just briefly. Since I'm European Affairs Minister, I'm more focused, of course, on EU funds and how to better use it. And But it's not just about the new infrastructure and new projects and better use of the EU funds. It's also, for example, the conditions in the railway network in Montenegro is one of the preconditions in the, in the negotiations to, to, to improve it. And um, bearing in my ha mind how many, how uh, we, uh, how much we invested in, in the railway um, network in Montenegro, and uh, how the the the, 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 the state of of, the, of um, the whole network and conditions there, and this is really challenging how to use current uh, infrastructure in the Western Balkans. So I am always opting, you know, for for the new one, and in that sense, I think that the civil society can also help help in um, improving methodology and preparation and implementation of the EU projects projects and EU funded projects. So in that sense, I think that there is also more space for for the civil society to be more included. But as I said, one, uh, to to just uh, repeat once again. I think that there is also need for the for the Marco mentioned the single pipeline um, uh, project and the timeline for Montenegro. Since we are uh, updating it regularly on two year basis, there is also space for inclusion to say civil society. So um, I, uh, maybe uh, in the Ministry of European Affairs we are investing investing so much. So um, time in, in order to uh, better develop procedures and then maybe we are neglecting lack of capacity in other institutions to deal with the EU funds and, and applications and implementation. So I think that we have to deal on many, many, let's say, um, paths and, and many um, activities uh, we have to undertake. Thanks, Jovan. Excellent. Uh, let's see if we have some other question or comment from the audience here. Okay. Okay. So please, would you be so nice? Yeah. Great. Excellent. I like this panel so far. You want me beer? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and Alexander too. Of course. So just uh, briefly. It's uh, free anyway. <laughs> uh, just briefly, I was I was inspired what was Marco saying at the beginning about the lack of data and about. Uh, the way the government speaking strategic partners for for the realization of, of uh, strategic projects. So uh, I think we are facing now 
a new level of a problem and of issue. I will take example of Serbia for this, because I think now we are going to legalization of this transparent, untransparent, sorry, procedure, and in fact creating of parallel legal system, and I will give you example for that. Two or three years ago, we have adopted the law that regulates critical infrastructure. So it was literally introduced by that law that the government has the right to choose strategic partner without concerning any uh, other existing laws that regulates a competition, that regulates procedure, that regulates everything. Later on, the same was tried with the law on waters, the same was tried with the law on mining. Sorry, this is for which country? For Serbia. Serbia, okay. Yes, we had Serbia. something similar in Macedonia as well. But okay, please go on. This is, I know that region is facing the similar issue. This is why I'm saying I'm taking the example of Serbia because it's the closest to me, of course. But, but uh, I, I, I know. So we are facing with legalization of this problem and it creates parallel legal framework. So it allowed the governments to choose which way they want to go and which law they want to apply. And two major problems are exactly that, uh, choosing strategic partner for re realization of a project. And the other is uh, announcing the project of strategic importance. And this is perfect excuse to not disclose the documents, to not explain everything to the interested public, to just go with the shady parts of the documents, etc., etc. So this is it. Yeah, thanks, uh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, fully if, I can, if I can just briefly, I completely agree. I forgot to mention it before, and uh, Ari also mentioned this fast-track uh, procedure. So what we were talking before was the procedures for selection of projects for capital budgeting national, for the WBIF, but there's a third one in which a state may decide to build something and then adopt a completely new legal system for it. We had it in Montenegro for our highway project, which is built upon a special law, law on highway, which then regulates uh, uh, how it is done, it regulates the procedure, it regulates the public procurement process. So uh, this is, and this was something that the, for example, the EU really didn't bother too much about. It wasn't really, uh, I guess it's a legitimate right of a country to decide how it wants to do that, but it's not in accordance with standards. And, it's, 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 and we may come to a situation where the smallest projects are under greatest scrutiny in all the phases of the pro process, and then the biggest one, for, for example, highway is the biggest project in the thousand years of Montenegrin history, and uh, it is done according to a special law, which has no, almost no procedure. It has a special uh, uh, procedures for bidders, for contractors, for public procurement process, and so on. So this is something, a problem that uh, it, it, has, it has to be curbed somehow, because we can amend the legal framework, and then the government just creates a new one when it, when, when it finds a suitable donor for a project. And we have, this is the phenomena of uh, rule by law instead of rule of law, because nothing is illegal. I mean, there is no corruption whatsoever, except that the law is not transparent. We have civil society have mentioned this example. Also, there are examples in Belgrade. The, I mean, the contraction of the me Belgrade Metro of strategic investors in Albania. I mean, uh, and uh, the regions tend to be to contract infrastructure according to these laws coming to civil society, the governments, coming to the civil society, it means that it was mentioned the word donors for the civil society. It's a very nasty word because those donors, they don't give anything in the sense that it's not their money that they give, but it's the money of their own taxpayers. They just manage this money. This is the first thing. Second, this is the word donate, you know, to give. They don't give. They ask for a service. The third point is that uh, when they contract uh, private contractors, they are not called donors anymore, they are called uh, whatever, contracting parties. We also want to be contracting parties in the sense that we produce the same services for higher quality, better engagement, and what we have and the private uh, contractors do not have is that we have skin in the game, right? We will live with those roads, we will live with those uh, water and waste, whatever facilities and everything, we will live in those countries. 
if we are using, and here I will stop, Marco said that kind of we are uh, uh, knocking on the door of the EU, but we do it not because the EU has the biggest problem. Actually, no, it's the contrary. It's because the EU allows us to do it. And by building up this partnership, we also get reinforced and we can be much more active and much more strong and much more, have much more agency for those second pipelines or third actors that get strategic projects, etc., etc. It's a win-win situation. Thanks, excellent. So we have like three more minutes to finish this panel. So let's try to go once again to the podium, to the audience. Is there someone who wants to ask or comment? Yes, Corey, please. Do you want to also come here? I would just like, I think this panel was fascinating, um, but I would just want to emphasize a difference that I see between two things that have been mentioned that I think we have to keep in mind. One is the problem of the absence of development planning, vision, dialogue with the economy that by now has been built in a haphazard way. We were just privatizing whoever comes. Things happen. Now we should be asking ourselves, it's over from kind of recovering past resources. How can we use better the inf infrastructure that's there? Will we use it and so on? And that's this development planning that the EU has tried to help us develop, at least in Serbia, that I myself was very involved with as a, uh, uh, when I was in the government last time in Serbia. Um, and that everybody tried to develop top down and it hasn't gone anywhere. Another issue is what more of this conversation right now happened about was, well, once you know you're gonna build a road or you've selected more or less a, a what you want to do, how you actually do it, under what kind of monitoring. And, and for some reason that gets confused and it should not be confused. Building the civil society that we need on monitoring the choices is a good way, but ultimately what we need is, again, what I've been saying uh, in these two days, is a civil society that can start mobilizing and asking the stakeholders of development what they need and informing them since the government won't do that. So that would be building a demand for development planning bottom up. Thanks, excellent, excellent. I think we should stop now uh, one minute before the, the planned time, but I think we don't have time to go with another round of uh, final questions and comments. Thanks, Corey, thanks, Marco, thanks, Ardian, thanks, uh, Nadim, thanks, Jovana, thanks, Ari, thanks, everybody else from the podium. And, and yeah. now beer. Yeah, um, no, tonight, tonight. tonight. <laughs> so I, I owe three beers, okay. Yeah. See you, see you. Cheers.